Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast, with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. I'm talking to uh, J.B. Eckel, the renowned Baha'i uh, musician, songwriter, founder of Badasht, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Co-founder. Co-founder, thank you. Um, Canadian. Where are you from? Saskatoon? Where is it? Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. That's a real place. That's a real place. It sounds like a Dr. Seuss rhyme. Yeah, but it's more like Fargo. JB, thanks for sitting down with me. We've been talking about you doing this podcast for a long, long time now, and uh, you only live about 10 miles away, so that, what a treat to have you <laughs> drive up the one-on-one freeway and sit in my office. We'll talk about why it hasn't happened yet. Also. Okay. Yeah. What, you want to go there? Why don't we go there now? Well, the truth is, is that uh, over the last few years, I've just been kind of almost like reinvestigating my own motivations and my Mm -hmm. my you know all the the you know you know how every once in a while you kind of have to return Mm -hmm. to the roots of why you're why you're a Baha'i why you're in it what Mm -hmm. what you know how did you how did I get here Mm yeah and uh and during that time um I've I've felt a little more private about it and haven't really wanted to get myself in the role of any kind of Spokesperson. Spokesperson. Yeah, yeah. At all, which is normal. Like, with my personality type, that's very normal. Hmm. Like, you could just shove me out on stage in front of, like, whatever, Woodstock 50th anniversary, and I'd be like, in 1844, irradiant youth, dot, dot, dot. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm a little bit more tentative about it right now because I, I my, my, my love for... The faith is is a, it's it's multifaceted and sure. you know nuanced and stuff, and I don't feel like I can encapsulate it as easily as I used to in sound bites. And so we'll see we'll see how it goes. Are if you, anybody can get it out of me, though, you can. Is, are you still in that phase? Are you still for in that sure? Mode? Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm and I'm 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 reading really cool. Like I'm reading some uh, some awesome. I went all the way back to. Uh, did you ever read Logos and Civilization? Or Gate of the Heart. Yeah, yeah, it's Saidi. I'm, yeah, I'm way into that stuff right yeah. now. And just like, that's kind of the, the path I'm on. I just, what what I love so much about that stuff is that... It's academic mysticism. It is, but but for some reason, what it does for me mm-hmm. is I just get pure adrenaline sometimes reading it. I mm. mean, it's, it's, a, it's heavy reading, but at the same time, he's exposing the underlying structure of the writings. And it's like, it's like watching Planet Earth. Yeah, it's like wow. watching somebody expose yeah. the the vast network of of thoughts and ideas that nobody's ever been able to synthesize before ever, and he's laying bare. That, Did you ever read that, that book, book *Sapiens*? That very well known mm-hmm. book *Sapiens*. It took off two or three years ago. This guy sure. Hariri. Oh, you should. It's fantastic. In fact, I recommended Saidi to read it because the guy's a Israeli sociologist, and he basically looks at the scope of human beings on planet earth and you know the the big changes that humans made that brought us to where we are why are we the most successful of the humanoids hominoids that existed on planet earth why why us uh and not neanderthals or any of the other ones and um and it's a fascinating like really broad look at humanity as a whole how, how we got here. And then his other books are about where we're going. That sounds like my jams. Yeah, he, it's really fantastic. I and it's, it. it's very, but it's very Shoghi Effendi in its scope. <laughs> and it's also very Saidi in its scope. And he was a sociologist, Saidi. That's how okay. his PhD is in sociology. And that's what they do is they look at these large trends, you know? So I think that's what I hear you saying is that underneath, you know, gate of the heart is like how the Bob is, uh, unleashing and delivering a, a framework of a completely new way of seeing the world spiritually. Absolutely. And for me, I mean, I think that the job of artists a lot of the time is to take those guys who do all the real heavy lifting, the intellectual, you know, dirty work of figuring all that out mm-hmm. 
and finding a way to express the essence of it in a painting or a three and a half minute song or yeah. whatever, even mm-hmm. if it's not the full unpacked version or an interpretive dance in my case in your case and i've seen them mm-hmm. and i gotta tell you man mm-hmm. you, you get a lot in there thank you thank you maybe i'll do one of these dances for you <laughs> you need a you need a video podcast for that <laughs> i i can help you figure that out a youtube now. channel but you jb you seem like someone to me it's interesting that you know every every couple months or a couple years we get together and have some very intense discussions but you seem to me like someone who's both very private and very public like you are intensely private and in your own world and like you contemplate stuff deep like really deep 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 but then and, i'm like hey man and then you go out in the world and, you, and you're kind of like in your own in your own cocoon kind of maybe even for a while maybe weeks or months or whatever and then you'll go out and you're like um the, you know, the, get out the top hat and cane. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, I'm, so tell me more about this frame that you're in. This, this yeah, mind frame. So, this I mean, it's nothing too, heart place that yeah. you're in right now. It's not too complex, but it's just the kind of thing where, you know, when when you, the way that I came into the faith was full on just fireworks and you know, yeah, and it was spectacular. Like the, the people that taught me about the Baha'i faith were so dynamic and the state I was in at the time was also pretty electrified. Like I, I really kind of came into the Baha'i world. So when and where is this? This was back in Saskatchewan in the late eighties. Okay. And I was fresh from living in Mexico for a while as a 17 and 18 year old. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of living out a weird rock and roll fantasy of playing in a, in a band as, as a teenager, um, a swinging door saloon called Poncho and Lefties that was actually a pimp bar, which I didn't understand for quite a while until I realized. And Poncho and Lefty, that's a famous song from someone. That's a Willie Nelson. Willie thing. Nelson. Okay. But the, anyway, so it was like a gringo bar. Okay. That had become this kind of this kind of watering hole for draft dodgers and, you know, exiles of the American dream and a bunch of Mexican Mexican uh, criminals that were feeding off of their culture there. Okay. And so it was it So was, here's this ginger curly headed <laughs> little Saskatoon boy. Mini Doonesbury with a guitar. <laughs> and and uh, just with just sans clue of what was going on mm-hmm. around me. Mm-hmm. But I was I was learning so much by being out of my element and living in Mexico. I mean, I was supposed to be, you know, I don't know, in a choir. Can we back up a little bit? How do you, how do you get to Poncho and Lefty's saloon? I, From Saskatchewan. There's, uh, you there's know, some missing pieces a there. A buddy of mine said, I know where we can get a gig. <laughs> and, and I was like, let's do it. So and, were you a high school rocker? Yeah, school rockers? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and he... Uh, wasn't and, Neil Young a, a little Canadian uh, Great there, Plains We're part of a rocker. long uh, tr- tradition. Yeah. But, um, but basically the he bands. said, yeah. And so what happened with him was his family was down there a lot because it was a classical music family. And in this town, mm-hmm. they studied classical music a lot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so they were very established there, which made it look kind of civilized to my family and everything. And it was, you know, it seemed like a pretty solid situation. But what ended up happening was we just went wild when we got down there and started living this, you know, this crazy... Well, of course, you were 17. We were 17. We had our own place and a band. It was nuts. I don't Mm -hmm. know how we got out of there alive, but basically a few things happened down there that kind of turned me into a seeker. Okay. Now, I had already lapsed out completely of my Catholic upbringing. Okay. And because I saw the movie, The Mission with Robert De Niro. Okay. And when I saw that movie, it fully dawned on me that as far as I could, as far as Catholicism was concerned, Elvis had left the building. Mm -hmm. Like I really felt Jesus had left the building. Yes. And, uh, I just couldn't get over it. It was heartbreaking, actually. Yeah. Mm. Because I was like, okay, if, if the Pope sanctioned all of this to happen, mm-hmm. then how can we say that there's any kind of uh, lineage anymore, especially of infallibility? So who do we turn to? We're lost. So I was panicked because Catholicism was where all the magic was in, in, you know, in my adolescent or pre-adolescent mind. I was fascinated with the Bible and everything. Like, I was really into it. And I loved being a Catholic kid. And, uh, you know, 
I didn't go to a very strict school and stuff, so I didn't have that whole experience that people mm-hmm. talk about. Okay. It was pretty chill. And um, and uh, so you so were, I you was turned off from I was turned off from that whole thing, but I carried a little bit of that light. Like I was just wondering if I was gonna find something down the road that that would kind of confirm the best parts of it. Hmm. So I didn't totally throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know okay, what I mean? Yeah. I, I kept a little, but it was like you, you know, private, mm. and I wasn't actively seeking, except for maybe, you know, in sort of pseudo hippie intellectualist teenage ways, mm-hmm. you know, which was mm-hmm. fun. Mm-hmm. And in Mexico, it was great. You could read like um, Carlos Castaneda and all that stuff, and mm-hmm. look around, and there would be actual cactus around, and it was great. <laughs> so I was I was into that, and then. Uh, I came back from that whole experience with a couple of things. There were some, there were finally some weird life threatening moments where some of the unsavory characters from both the American and the Mexican side of my crowd, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, it got, it got real, Mm. you know, and all of a sudden I realized that I was in, I was actually in a really dangerous situation with all these people Mm -hmm. that it will, it wasn't a game to them, you know? Right. And, I was so young, I just didn't understand, you know? So I got out in one piece. Mm -hmm. But before that happened, I had a moment uh, on the rooftop of my little apartment that was really uncharacteristic for that time in my life. I was in the process of rejecting all authority. Sure. Mm -hmm. As one does. You know, 17, 18 years old. I was creating, I was kind of creating the cult of me. Like Mm -hmm. the little mini religion of me, you know? And sign me up. Right. Exactly. <laughs> totally. Uh, you know, it's something you, you, a lot of people have to go through. And, echolism. Yeah. Well, <laughs> echolism. Population one. No, I'll, 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 I'll join. Population two. There we go. Um, I'm on the roof and I, and I, I had this sort of almost like a waking dream. Okay. Uh, literally, it was like having a dream, but I was just sitting there looking, you know, kind of looking at the rooftops mm-hmm. from my rooftop. And I had this little image in my head. Of me walking through the rubble of post-earthquake Mexico City, which they had had that huge giant earthquake uh, not too long before Oh, that. okay. So that image was sort of in my mind, you know. Mm-hmm. And I saw it through the taxi cabs when I first went to Mexico. So in my little dream, I was, I was walking through that and kind of like communicating with families and stuff in Spanish, I think. Okay. And... Uh, which I'm still not a good Spanish speaker to this day, but mm-hmm. at that time, I, I, in my little vision, I could speak it. And what was interesting about it was that I was not there on my own behalf. I was there as representing a higher authority of some kind, mm. which was the opposite of where I was at. You know what I mean? Mm. I was running from authority, and yet I had this little weird... Thing, this so notion. You, so you were that walking I was through gonna, this rubble, talking yeah, to people, talking to people, hanging out with people in Spanish, in a spirit of service in Spanish, and I was, I was not in charge. And this was, I like, was clearly not. And you, you were awake, and you were on your roof. Was it the nighttime? Was it, it was night? almost like dawn. Okay, it was great. You know, it was like the magical sunrise. And you just, you just had this vision of yourself. It was probably sleep deprivation. I was probably <laughs> still up. Okay. If it was sunrise, let's face it. Yeah, that's. <laughs> um, so whatever the case, I carried that away, and I, I thought that was really interesting. And the other thing that I had was this idea that I was going to be about fifty when I found out what that thing was, that authority. Wow. Now maybe I was just buying myself a lot of time to mess around. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's a good window. Mm-hmm. Eighteen to fifty. You know, that's a lot of latitude. Okay. So. So, but, but I carried that kind of with me along with the kind of, you know, preserved in amber faith of my, my childhood. Yeah. And I thought, okay, well, you know, at some day, uh, at some point in the future, I will find this, this higher truth, Ah. but probably no time in the near future. Yeah. Okay. Um, I barely got back to Canada and my best friend had decided to go all hardcore Baha'i. And he had grown up around it. Was this the friend that went to Mexico with you? Or no. Or this one back He had Canada? gone on a crazy, crazier adventure than the one I was having. Even more wacky and life-threatening. And he came back in one piece. You Canadians are out of listen, control. Listen, we were nuts. And he was following the Grateful Dead. They were still around. And, you know, whatever. He got in all kinds of trouble. Basically, 
I'll give you his number. You got to have him on this thing. Great. Um, <laughs> and we looked at each other and had this recognition that, you know, our, our middle school friendship was about to blossom into this crazy rock and roll partnership. And the only thing that was going to screw it up for me was that he decided to go all religious overnight. How did he hear about the Baha'i faith? Oh, he and his dad were into it for years, but he okay. always kind of waffled. Yeah. He never really, you know, he loved it, but he never, this was the moment he decides to commit. Okay. And I was like, no, this is going to screw everything up. The deep dive. I just couldn't believe it. And so what I did was I said, you know, give me some books and uh, give me some, you know, let me, let me meet some of the, some of your influences, some of these old people that are, that are talking to you. And he started taking me to these, these little hangs, you know, mm -hmm. they weren't really like fireside straight up. It was more of a, just hanging around with some really nice folks and talking about spiritual subjects, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he, he said, cool, cool. And he gave me some literature and everything. And my plan was to kind of deprogram him. Right. Okay. You know, like take him out in a shack and the. Did you think the, he was in like a cult kind of thing, or you just not thought necessarily? He was misguided? I know. I don't even know if I thought he was misguided. I thought he was definitely misguided according to my agenda. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um. And I was like, "This is this will not do. Like, this is just going to mess up my plan." So what did you start? And, the, and what about the cult of what about the cult of JB? What was yeah, going to happen to yeah. that? Echolism. In the face of, you know. Five, six million people around so what, the world. What did he have you read? Um, it was uh, some compilations, and then there was the old standby, the Esselmont book, uh -huh. The Hola and the New Era. Okay. And, um, and right from when I sat down with this book, I knew I was in trouble. Because the old cover of the 70s cover or the 80s cover of Bahá'u'lláh and the New Era was a photo of the Chicago temple. Yeah. In Wilmette. And... A really nice photo of it. And I, I remember looking, just looking at that thing, I knew I was in trouble. I just was, I saw that and I was like, oh God, here we go. I'm, I'm feeling it. <laughs> it That's was amazing. so not cool. So I read the book and I started to cross-reference this book with things that I remembered that rang true. Mm -hmm. from the Bible when I was a kid mm -hmm. and I have a really good memory. So I was remembering a lot of specific stuff and you know what I mean? Things, mm -hmm. things from, from learning from being in Catholic school and stuff and just kind of going through that whole experience. And then I would go to these little meetings and these people were, they, I couldn't get mad at them because they were really, uh, they were sweethearts. They were so nice. They, they didn't ever push anything on me. Mm -hmm. They answered my questions. They were endlessly patient you know, we would sit there and drink their coffee. And then my friend's dad took the other approach. He would be real heavy handed. And you probably know about Tim Hortons, right? Sure. Okay. Well, in those days, uh, it was called Robin's uh, Coffee and Donuts. And it was the same model. I think it may still be around. Okay. But basically, you go to Tim Hortons at some point in the evening and you talk about crap until... 4 a.m. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we were at that age. His dad would sit there with us telling us stories from the dawn breakers mm -hmm. in the donut shop mm -hmm. just swigging coffee until god knows what hour in, and this guy tunes. this guy had a real job like he his name is ted i love you ted glabish anyway he what he would do is he would get a shout out i got a total shout out he would go to real real people work in the morning as a contractor oh wow with responsibilities mm -hmm. you know what i mean in mm -hmm. the cold Mm -hmm. Plug in your car like an hour before, you, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and I would keep him up all night trying to refute the Baha'i faith, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was just like, he just knew. He just knew that I was going to get it. And mm -hmm. he took the opposite approach. So it was kind of a good cop, bad cop thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where these other lovely folks would be like, Oh, JP, you know, what other, what other, what else would you like to talk about? But the bad cop was in the donut shop. The bad cop was in the donut, amazingly, okay. how it all works. Yeah, all and he together. said, and he would be like, and he actually said, he said, hey, if I'm a little heavy with you guys, here's the reason why. Mm -hmm. Picture a tug of war in which you guys are the rope and the whole rest of the world is on one side, the media, society, materialism, sex, drugs, rock and roll, 
And all that's on the other side is me. So if I pull a little hard, mm-hmm. don't get mad. Mm-hmm. Because you can understand my position as a parent. And he was kind of becoming a surrogate parent to me, too. Oh, that's great. Because I, I was like a fatherless teenager. Mm-hmm. And he laid it on pretty heavy. And he knew I could take it. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I learned an extraordinary amount in a short period of time because of these mentors that I had. Mm-hmm. So fast forward, uh, we ended up having uh, all these firesides and, um, you know, just informal conversations at our place. But we would do things like get together three days before and say prayers for two hours in that room that we were going to use and write down any names that popped into our head. And those would be the people we would invite. Like it was super, super hardcore. Wow. And that's, I mean, it was exciting. And of course, you know, everybody and their dog became a Baha'i in that circle. Wow. You know, and a lot of, and and it was great. I'd like to see dog Baha'is. Yeah, right. Oh, they'd be so sweet. (laughs) Anyways. um, So that's kind of like, it was, it was a pressure cooker, you know, it was real intense. Yeah. And then. And then we took off and we went to Belize and, and I went to Guyana. And I mean, it was, it was like, you know, hotbeds. Of so you were just shot out of a cannon. You went absolutely right after uh, declaring. Yeah. And I couldn't wait because I kind of had a feeling that I wasn't going to get the full picture of what the Baha'i faith, what the Baha'i community looked like in North America. Mm-hmm. Because in my opinion, everything in North America feels a little veiled. There's a little buffer mm-hmm. between mm-hmm. you and reality mm-hmm. here and it's it's sometimes it's hard to touch you know what i mean mm-hmm. it's it's kind of mm-hmm. hard to break through that barrier yeah you're almost like you're cut you know, off from the spirit there's in a way. yeah and, and so i kind of felt like i needed to be in other environments where yeah. it wasn't going to be like that just so you know and i didn't really want a north american centric uh vision yeah. of it, the faith and it's a world faith so it's a world faith and that's what i loved about it yeah so Anyway, so reading Esselmont and all that stuff, it just it just got me. And the biggest things about it that knocked me out at that age were probably the same as most people. One was progressive revelation. Sure. You know, I could finally reconcile the seemingly unreconcilable different faiths of the world. Mm-hmm. That was huge to me, which mm-hmm. I was doing musically at the time. Mm-hmm. I was I was going to the library and get, taking home vinyls of all kinds of world music. And I was kind of processing like Vietnamese folk music and, you know, Indian ragas and whatever I was, uh, that's kind of what I was doing musically at the time. Mm -hmm. And so this became a total extension of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, I could kind of see how it all worked. And then I, overnight I wanted to be a, you know, kind of a a comparative religion scholar, (laughs) Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, happens to a lot of Baha'is. Like, you mm-hmm. become a Baha'i, and then all of a sudden, oh, I gotta read the Quran. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I gotta read the Bhagavad Gita. I gotta do it all. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was, I went full on into all that world. And I mean, you know, after a few years of that, you almost take for granted how much of an influence that had. Like right now, if I went out in the world and just totally ditched out on the Baha'i faith. Everything I do and think and my whole window on the world would be a product of my studies of the faith. You understand? Like a lot of Baha'is don't. But I don't understand. If you ditch the Bible, you saying, quit being a yeah, Baha'i. Yeah, like it, I, I feel like I feel like you'd have to completely reinvent n- no, how you did everything. No, or? I would have all the benefits still. Oh. I'd be walking around uh-huh. having the benefit of what I learned from it. Mm-hmm. I just feel like it's easy to forget how much of a revelation that is, Mm. especially if you're young, when you find it, Mm -hmm. when you're in a formative time Mm. and it influences your worldview and you become so darn smart because of your, because you're reading the Baha'i writings, Mm -hmm. you're Mm -hmm. getting it straight from the source. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you go out in the world and people are like, Oh, you know, Mm -hmm. you're deep. You know what I mean? <laughs> you're like, no. So I, it makes you instantly it, deep. Yeah, you saying. know, and, 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 but in reality, what you're doing is, you know, you're just reflecting some extremely deep stuff. Yeah. And I, and I, I've been like part of, part of my kind of approach to reading all this stuff now that I, that we were talking about before is that I just want to remind myself of the magic of that. I want to mm-hmm. feel that velocity mm-hmm. of, of mind opening 
stuff. Saidi will do that for you. And mm-hmm. some of these other, you know, like Hatcher and, mm-hmm. you know, there's a bunch of Baha'i writers that will take you on that, on that journey. On those journeys, yeah. Almost to that same extreme of when you first, you know, found out about it all. So I don't know, maybe I'm just going to be chasing that, uh, that feeling that for, spiritual forever. high sure. of youth. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you know me. It's, I can, I can get there pretty quick. I think it's a challenge. <laughs> I think it's a challenge because I think a lot of um, Baha'is came into the faith the way that you did um, with some mystical experiences, some passionate experiences, kind of ignited on fire. And then the reality of being a Baha'i and living in the suburbs and working in your cluster... And paying your electric bill on a Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, is, you know, there's uh, there's a lot. Th- the world <laughs> conspires to, to, to drain that energy away. And even the Baha'i community, it's a very, it's a difficult time because we're not just throwing away our belongings and walking from village to village teaching the faith where we're doing a lot of administration building, you know, and... We're doing a lot of like institute process and cluster reflection gatherings and planning devotionals and when's the next children's class and who's going to bring the cookies. So there's a lot of that work that I think a lot of Baha'is are challenged by uh, because it it can be deflating or it can feel like they're not connected to the source. Mm-hmm. So how do we do that work? How do we do the the work on the on the cluster level? And keep the spirit alive. Okay. This is a good transition. Go. Because um, I think part of that is, I mean, in a certain way, that's what that's what art is for. Because, um, you know, if we try to do this stuff without, I'll just go with music since that's my, you know, my pet art form, my favorite. Um, I think that the... You know, it's easy to make the mistake of getting into the nitty gritty, hard work, community building process um, with almost in a dry sort of way where we feel like we should be able to do it without being inspired. It's kind of a stoic value, like almost in a hierarchy of values. I feel like a lot of people, like from my background, which is sort of akin to a Midwestern uh, American background, you know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you shouldn't need to be excited. You shouldn't need to be inspired. You should you should just be able to show up and just do the work and milk the cows at 40 below at five in the morning. And I think that's a noble uh, sentiment. Yeah, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. <laughs> exactly. And shut up while you do it and yeah. don't complain. And... I get it, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'm not sure that's how it works. And mm. if you go and study other movements that have that have changed the course of society over the last hundred years, you're going to find things like the civil rights movement, where art and writing and music and you know those things were it was like a chicken and egg thing where you you, you talk to people from the civil rights movement and they say. I don't know, you know, which one inspired the other. The work we were doing in the streets Mm. versus what the artists were singing about on the radio versus the community songs we were singing while we marched. And There wasn't wasn't a separation between those. There was also not a separation between faith and social justice at the time. People nowadays forget how religiously inspired those early civil rights leaders were. They yeah. were talking about the Bible and they were they were talking about about Jesus Christ, you know. It was social justice, but it had a it had uh love and spirit at the center of it. But right. I, I love the point that you're making that it was all there there weren't it wasn't delineated. There weren't these little boxes. Art yeah. and service and and demonstration and uh and justice and um community all kind of wove together. That's right. And so I guess what I'm positing is that you kind of can't have one without the other. Like you can to a degree, Mm -hmm. but if you really want to kind of take it to the next level, you're going to need both. You're going to need the inspiration Mm -hmm. that comes from 
the art as as a, as a devotional thing or mm-hmm. as a, just an inspiration thing, you know. So I, are you saying that communities could, it would best behoove communities to get back into the spirit and to weave art in with the, with the kind of, I hate to say it, kind of the more boring administrative work that they're doing. You, yeah. You can't have one without the other. You or can't. Kind of like, to me, you can't. I mean, and, we're and administering it, without without tapping into the spirit. Yeah. Um, art is part of that spirit. I was part of a consultation one time with uh, an LSA. Mm-hmm. And we were brought in to consult about some, some community stuff. It was a bunch of my buddies up in Victoria and, and me. And we went in with the assembly and... You know, we sang through most of the assembly meeting. We basically burned up most of the most of the time, mm-hmm. singing our faces off in the assembly <laughs> meeting, because that's how we rolled that at the time. That's that just doesn't how happen it. in suburban Los Angeles. No, I know, but what if it did? Okay, so here's what happened. Um, after we got through that, we sort of like put forth our little things, our, our, whatever we were there to talk about, and then we left. And their entire consultation lasted about 10 minutes. So what does that say? Mm -hmm. They called us with decisions before we got to the coffee place. Like they were like, okay, we had our consultation. (laughs) We're good. Here's the plan. And it was, you know, fairly well laid out. They Mm -hmm. knew exactly Mm -hmm. what was going on Mm -hmm. in the amount of time it took, Mm -hmm. you know, to drive halfway across Victoria, BC, which is not a very big town. Mm -hmm. And we thought, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, because we went there first. We got there as a group. There was unity mm. before the consultation started. And that's the thing I think we forget about music is that like Dr. King wouldn't even start until he had already had Mahalia Jackson up there singing. And now those things aren't usually included in the excerpts, you mm-hmm. know, the, 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 the amazing speeches that he gave. They were already there before he started talking. Sure. Yeah, I won't do a fireside unless there's music before it. Even if it's bad, you know? It's 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 something, it just, it's it almost shifts, like it cracks through the yeah, that barrier that we talked it about. It shifts your paradigm. It you know, you you show up thinking you're coming to a lecture and then all of a sudden someone sings and then all right. of a sudden your heart is open to a different kind of experience. Sure. And then on top of it, if it's good, yeah, if it's good. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. So, like, imagine sitting there in a crowd, and you're kind of shifty, and you've been on your feet all day, and now you're going to a thing. And, you know, you can't wait to hear Dr. King speak. And then up comes Aretha Franklin or somebody and sings a bunch of hymns. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And 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 gets you to the point where your, your, your hands are already up in the air. And then he goes and gives, I have a dream. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to go and change the world for sure. So I, I really think that... One of the things that we forget in our culture, I'm not going to blame this on the Baha'is and our community, because if you look at the culture at large, Mm -hmm. there's not really a sense of community art. Like I'll return back to that same, uh, the same thing, the civil rights kind of like all my, all my buddies, what's up, Eric, um, who come from that background, Mm -hmm. educated me about it. And mm-hmm. they told me the reason why you see an Aretha Franklin rise to the top, the cream rises to the top, is because at the base of her community, there's a sense of we can all sing, mm-hmm. whether we're gifted or not. Mm-hmm. We're going to sing. We, we can all sing. And then, of course, in an environment like that, you're going to have these gems. Mm-hmm. And you see it in any music-friendly culture out there. You see it in Ireland. You see it in Africa, certainly. You know, you see it in different places where... There's enough community mm-hmm. art action going on mm-hmm. that that it's going to nurture. Uh, so it's not an either or. You've got these amazing gems that come out and you've got your Aretha Franklin. But you've also got the fact that everybody sings full voice all the time. Mm-hmm. And so there's a really strong call response relationship there between the professional artists, the community artists. The people doing, you know, making the cookies cookies to take to the event. Mm -hmm. Everybody's on the same page. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way, the reason um, that the music on the first Badasht uh, CD sounds the way it does Mm -hmm. is because it came out of a community experience like that, Mm -hmm. where we were experimenting with blurring those lines. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, like the, 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 the things that I saw during that time, 
Where was that? Was that, that was it? up in Victoria. Oh, okay. And the things that we saw during that, uh, it kind of ruined us for a lot of normal, um, normal community life, because we saw what it's like when you when you have when you break down all those barriers and you've got a whole bunch of people not only performing and yeah. doing art, but also grabbing everybody that's out there in the community and bringing them into it to right to inform that. There's so much I want to say about and that. Having the, and having the assembly back it up. Which is crucial. It was major. The, I love the <laughs> idea awesome. of the, the difference between congregation, which is how most kind of church groups run in North America, yeah, and community. And that what the Baha'i faith is going for is community and building community. And community is grassroots. But congregation kind of means, oh, uh, there's one charismatic leader and everyone sits and listens passively. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a passive worship on a regular basis, but community is much kind of wilder and richer mm -hmm. than that. I would say the same applies to art because we've taken the arts and made them congregational also. Right. So you've got the, so how do you make the arts really specifically? Yeah. How do you make the arts community based? How do you do that? Um, it's okay to, Number one, it's okay if your kids want to be doctors and lawyers. Absolutely. Send them in to be doctors and lawyers. Mm -hmm. There's no problem there. Send them to the best schools and yada, yada. If they want to make art, try to help them figure it out. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Get mm -hmm. them, a, you know, get to make, make sure that they, that they at least do a double major with business. But, but te let them learn art. Yeah. Kids should be, Abdu'l-Bahá says that kids should be taught music. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's just a sort of conceptual thing where they're supposed to be taught music so that they grow up cultured and have an understanding or mm -hmm. because Mozart makes you smarter or something. No, I think they're supposed to learn it because they're supposed to do it. They're actually supposed to grow up in a, in a, in a community that's vibrant. They, you know so, how the House of so Justice constantly talks about vibrant, vibrant, vibrant communities. Mm -hmm. I, w what's the image you get? When you picture a vibrant singing, community, singing together. <laughs> it's the first thing you think yeah, of. Yeah. You think of some kind of party in Colombia or something where everybody's yeah. hanging out and there's yeah. music everywhere. So I, I think that is specifically. Yeah. So support for the children. Kids need to be music. No matter literate. what their path is going to be academically. They should be learning instruments mm -hmm. and they should be, they should be put into situations to use that to serve. Okay. And they should be encouraged to get good at it. Mm hmm. Like, you know, I, I know some families like that where mm -hmm. they just, that's just part of their thing. Their kids mm -hmm. are learning, you know, they're learning how to be musical. And that I'm just talking about music, but it could be anything. Mm -hmm. How many times do you hear people read something mm -hmm. and they read it in that dead reading voice mm -hmm. I, and you can't get any meaning from it? I right? harp on about that quite a bit. Okay. Now, what about the kids that have been through Mayor's thing in New York? Mm -hmm. They don't sound like that. No, I, w I could listen to them. You're read about the children's theater the th company, children's Mayor theater Montessori. company. Any one of those kids could read right. Advent of Divine Justice to me, and I would catch every single thing in there mm -hmm. because they 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 learned how to do it. They learned mm -hmm. how to show up and say, "Hi, I am so and so, and this is what I'm about." And, mm -hmm. and kids don't learn to do that. So, so training yeah. in the same it's way that the, that the early Persians would train. Because nowadays, I don't know how much Baha'i kids. No Baha'i kids ever chant anymore. You know, they're not taught to chant. Um, I won't say no. Very few Baha'i kids I see have learned to chant. But in the early days, the, the Persians would really train chanting into the into mm -hmm. Persian culture in the same way like in American culture that kids can be trained to read um, expressively and trained to make music to uh, holy lyrics. So to achieve that... I don't know if this is going to be dropping a bomb or what, but to achieve that, mm -hmm. if, you, if you really want kids to come up in your community with that sense of vibrancy and, and drama and, you know, the heartfeltness and the art, you need to also recognize who can teach them that. Mm -hmm. So that means that identifying the folks in the community, they're not going to get it by osmosis. You know what I mean? They're not just going to magically go on YouTube and learn how to do all this. They're going to need mentors. So I think one of the big 
uh, the big steps that's coming up ahead of us here in this community building process is to, to not alienate creative folks and to give them stuff to do. Partly to raise up generations of kids mm -hmm. who can actually cut. Uh, there's a quote where uh, it was on behalf of Shoge Fendi. And he says, um, uh, the cause will spread like wildfire when its spirit and teachings are presented from the stage and in art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and he says that art uh, is better at... at uh, I, I'm paraphrasing the heck out of it. Okay. But he says, basically, it can bring out those sentiments, those noble sentiments in, in the masses mm -hmm. better than any, you know, cold rationalizing. Mm -hmm. That's Shoghi Effendi, mm -hmm. you know, and you're talking about a very left brain, very book learned guy. Mm -hmm. And he was calling it, you know, right. and saying that's a that's how it's going to spread like wildfire. Mm -hmm. which we've seen in the case of Seals and Croft, Youth Workshop, mm -hmm. you know, many different times we've seen that. Dig Infinity. You never know. Uh, it could happen with That's why any, it, any one of us. You spent some time in Oregon. Them. They're really good at this in Oregon. <laughs> They're really good at it in Oregon. I'm not sure and, why, but uh, they are really good. I know. Good. It's, it was white bread land over there. But they, you know? The Winstock Youth. Um, You've been there. Yes. I've been there. It's incredible. And then... My son went to the uh, Carmel Baha'i camp. Oh, that's great, too. And they just, they sing until after the sun goes down. Man. They sing till 10 or 11 at night, and they just sing song after song after song after song. And you know what? It's that healthy environment. Because, again, in that, this is great. Because mm -hmm. you said, like, this is a, this is a, like, this is not the African-American church experience. This is in the woods of Oregon mm -hmm. with a bunch of people that look like you and me. Who are wearing socks with sandals. <laughs> totally. And you know what? There's no... They they all expect themselves to be able to just hang out and sing, whether, they, whether, whether they're individually talented or not, yep. which is a key ingredient, right? Another key ingredient is when somebody comes into that environment who can really throw down and do it, mm -hmm. they totally respect that and give mm -hmm. that space to breathe, like Yossi yeah. or Love the Yossi. others that have come, mm -hmm. you know. He's like, they, they get it. They mm -hmm. get that they don't discourage her from being excellent in the name of community. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She is There's allowed... There's room for both. There's room for saying. both. Mm -hmm. she, should, she should not only be able to shine and mm -hmm. be the awesome badass that she is, yeah. she should also be inspiring a you know 12 year olds to be able to do it yeah and she pulls that off and i think that's you know that oregon thing man it's magic you know what i kind of left my i think i buried my heart in oregon what that's gross what isn't does that, that mean? disgusting what does that mean i don't know i just i've never gotten over it i just love i just love being up there drinking strong coffee in gloomy, sleety weather, and being <laughs> sitting on my laptop with you are all the other hipsters. Here you are in Southern California, <laughs> wasting away, your soul being sucked out of your eyeballs by the strength of the sun and, and all the, yeah, all the Teslas really and the Kardashians. I finally discovered baseball hats. That helps a lot. Okay. Well, you know, having a big duck bill over your eyes oh, yeah. actually really helps a lot. Yeah. But I'm, I'm loving being back here in Southern California now because... Um, I've got a rock band, so like yeah. that alone. Okay. I mean that that fixes everything. Okay. And then um, my kids, my kids are, my kids are are turning into wonderful little gentlemen. Um, and I, I don't uh, know your younger one very well, but oh, man. Sammy J is a is a he's a legend. Sammy J is a deep soul. Yes. He's older than all of us somehow, and, and I can't wait to expert see expert fiddler too. He's become a heck. He's in the, he's in the CSUN Philharmonic now. That's crazy. They're all older than him. It's only one one other kid his age in there. And and Gabriel is, you'll see, he's a warrior. He's got the Cuban uh, gene. Oh, he nice. got more of that. <laughs> so like we're 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 doing great here. I ha I'm I I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing kind of how to find the mojo of of the mixing the professional music career with the community stuff again. Um, I want to do it in ways that are you know, energetically sustainable for me, but also I just miss the intensity too. So that's always a dance that you do, right? Trying to figure those two things out. Yeah. But it'll never go away. 
you know, once you, once you experience those things and, and, uh, and, and you get in there and you, you get that, that, the, the love that comes into the room in a place like Winstock or Carmel, you're, 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 that sticks with you. That becomes like your standard forever. Mm, mm. So if I think like, you know, maybe Southern California could use some of that old Oregon spirit. Let's bring it down here. Let's get them all on a bus and take them up there. <laughs> there we go. Just ruin it. Or bring them down here. <laughs> Thank you for the coffee, by the way. Well, I, yeah, I know. There's, there's a big coffee uh, thread running through this entire podcast, by the way. I think your I spirituality <laughs> is wedded to, to caffeine. That's terrible. You know that I quit for a couple of months there. Nice. I quit everything, though. Did you know that? Did I tell you this? No. What'd you quit? I, had, I got, I got Sugar? Uh, a nutritionist. Okay. And I felt like garbage. And I was, that was basically the premise. I just said, you know, I've never taken an interest in my health. Yeah. For reasons that we'll probably get into in a minute. Okay. <laughs> and, and, but now it's getting ridiculous mm-hmm. where I kind of feel tired all the time mm-hmm. and, you know, everybody wants me to do things and mm-hmm. I hate it. Mm-hmm. And what's up with that? You know, and I'm getting kind of like bloaty and pasty even more than normal. Mm-hmm. And, and what do I do? And he said, well, and he's a Baha'i. That's the best part. He goes, well, here's what you do. And it it was right before the fast. Oh, no. He goes, so this year, you're going to do something different for your fast. You're actually not going to, you're not going to do the fast, but you're going to do something way worse and way harder. You're going off all sugars, all sugars, including hidden sugars, fruity sugars, whatever, all processed anything. Now, could you have an apple? Yep. You can have that. Okay. Yep. But right. e- easy on the fruit. Okay. Um, you're getting off all gluten. You're getting off all, I forget all the things. Obviously dairy was out. White, white flour. Um, just any, yeah, for fried almost, foods almost anything. Of? Yes. Fried foods. Yeah. I mean, basically. And caffeine. You're going to be off food. And he threw caffeine oh, on the sure. that list. Yeah. And you know what? It almost came a, a, in at the end of the conversation. He threw it in there as if it was no big deal. Oh, and like, caffeine. Oh yeah. And caffeine. And I was like. What is that sound effect? That's, that's a, a cricket? That's a cricket. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, so I totally ditched all everything except for like broccoli and stuff and water and probiotics for months. And we, but we, first we got through the fast. Okay. I call him at the end of the fast and I was celebrating, you know, I was like, I did it. And, you know, I had, I had gotten through and he said, you know, you may need a lot more alone time. Basically, he was trying to say, you're going to be a jerk and you're going to hate everyone. You're okay. going to want to fight me. <laughs> and, uh, and that happened. Like, I really, I really got into a bad place in the first couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. My body was like, no, you know, mm-hmm. this is mm-hmm. not without a fight. Mm-hmm. And then I felt great. Mm-hmm. And then I felt like garbage again. He said, there will be a second wave. And you'll wow. be meaner and you'll be worse. Anyway, I went through all the different stages and then, uh, you know, now I've been sort of reintroducing things bit by bit. Hmm. I definitely felt a lot better. I definitely needed to do that. Yeah. And it was actually a cool fast because I was still kind of in there with everybody. Like I still felt like the camaraderie yeah. of the fast yeah. because I was like, y'all have no idea. Right. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I ate something, but look at what I ate. Well, it's ultimately a, <laughs> it's ultimately a sacrifice. And uh, you're sacrificing and you're remembering why you're sacrificing and you're spiritualizing your food. Absolutely. And yeah. he said, I want you to give this diet to, to God. I want you to give this whole experience to Baha'u'llah and lay it at his feet and say, I am, I yeah. am forgoing coffee mm. because you nice. are a manifestation of God nice. and I want to be a better human being. So all that to say... That I've kind of, I'm drinking coffee now. I'm I'm taking it easy on it. I'm careful. Okay. Uh, I don't go wild and drink it all day. Okay. You know, I'm kind of like in a moderation thing now with okay. the whole thing, except for dairy. I'm hardcore on the dairy. Hardcore doing the nope, dairy or off, off the dairy? Yeah. yeah. Because I have allergies and stuff. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm still trying to figure that one out. Yeah, I went vegan for like, I don't know if the audience is even interested in this, but. Are you guys still even there? I don't know. They're listening. 
Um, uh, they tuned into the 27 other Baha'i podcasts that are out there. <laughs> Yeah, but this not, is awesome. There's not. We're there talking are. about kind of half-heartedly going vegan. What could I be know, more I went, fascinating I went hardcore than that? vegan. I went vegan six or seven months, um, and I've, I've kind of been off of it now. Um, but I will say that one thing I do not like and I don't ever want to eat again is dairy. And it, it really, eating dairy is like eating glue and like eating shoes. Wow. I'd rather eat glue and shoes than dairy. See, I'm not there yet, man. No, no, I'm oh, still, just, I'm still thinking it's about. It's so heavy. It gums you up. It brings. I mean, you I'm not craving down. it. Yeah. But when it comes to certain things like Mexican food, yeah, which is sort of what, uh, how I survive. Okay. That gets a little dicey. Just get for the me. fish tacos without the cheese. I know, okay. but and I want yogurt. All right, let's let's move off the dietary stuff. Anyway, the point is, I started caring somewhat about my health. Okay. And you have to understand this is how, a new thing. how weird that is for me. Yeah. I mean, I have an aversion to all things healthy for Self, me, self-care. not for other people. Yeah. Self-care, yeah. you know, because I, because of <clears throat> some stuff in my upbringing, I love how I cleared my throat when I said that. Yeah. I just never got excited about taking care of myself. Yeah. And it's a huge challenge for me. So this was all kind of part of this process of trying to wake up on many different levels and figure out what's holding you back. Like what's still holding you back? You've got the revelation. You've got music. You've got family. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Come on. You Mm -hmm. won the lottery so many times. Yeah. You married your dream girl. Mm -hmm. What? Would you like fries with that? You know? (laughs) What do you want? Would you like gluten with that? (laughs) And then... So why did you not take care? Of, what? How did you learn to not take care of yourself as a kid? Um, you had a you had a pretty uh, difficult upbringing. I in remember. some ways, I had I had a I had a a, a, a sort of a a, a kind of cr- crazy yin and yang upbringing mm-hmm. because um, the women in my world mm-hmm. were uh, really great. Like they really took care of us kids and. And some of the men were really cool too, but most of them were um, just in the process of total self-destruction. Mm-hmm. Like, and, you know, I mean, th- it was mostly alcoholism. I mm-hmm. mean, it was mostly alcoholism in the family, but but there were some other threads of kind of depression and different things that mm-hmm. nobody really talked about in the 1970s. What about abuse and rage? Uh, yeah, well, that all kind of goes along with the alcohol thing. Um, at least it did, uh, in, with, with, with my situation. I mean, I'm sure some people don't want to talk about this on the internet, but you know, we're only alive for like a tiny blip just of, a speck. You know, and, yeah. then, and then yeah. it's just cosmic, yeah. you know, after that. So whatever, uh, alcoholic rage was just the norm in my world. I mm-hmm. mean, that was, you know, we didn't. We didn't, uh, we didn't know what to do about it. We didn't know how to deal with it. There were mm-hmm. no real resources. It was just sort of having that around. And my dad and his dad before him mm-hmm. were just, you know, uh, you know, it was normal. Like these were the kind of guys that, that crashed their car into cop cars. You know, <laughs> that was just kind of how it was. Mm-hmm. And... So part of my rejection of authority as a teenager was that I didn't, when you reject the authority of your own dad, everything kind of goes along with that mm. because he, he's sort of like a spokesperson for all of all authority in mm-hmm. a way. Mm-hmm. And I just couldn't, you know, I got really lucky that the, that the, the, pr- the priest at my Catholic school was this super cool guy. And he mm. was like a guy figure that I could look to and go like, this is a very upright guy. He's, mm-hmm. he's a stand-up guy and mm-hmm. he's, he's, you know, he's humorous and faithful and he's got all these great qualities. Mm-hmm. So that was really cool. And you know, there were some things that my uncle and, uh, and then in later years, you know, I nurtured a relationship with my brother that was really cool. And like some, some stuff came out, but when I was little, the dad, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. a lot of kids out there in the world have this experience, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of young men that are sort of lost without the dad. Yeah. And you don't really understand the power of that until you have a little boy. Yeah. And you see the way he looks at you. Yeah. When he's like about four, five years old and you realize I can screw this kid up right now. Like I could mess this kid up in 
five seconds yeah. flat by planting a dumb idea in his head yeah. that he's going to carry around for the rest of his life. And that was done. And, and especially four and five, yes, they're still very attached to their moms. But especially now, like my son is 14. and Oh, you could still do it. Oh, no, Believe not me. still do it. Like really do it. Like <laughs> really, do it. really even do it more because... 13, 14, 15, they're really looking to their dads. I see him oh looking goodness. to me for for guidance in a way and approval. And it's almost, I still feel like a kid myself. I'm like 52 going on, you know, being an unemployed 27-year-old. You know, that's my maturity level. So I'm like, wait, you're looking to that's me That's why we're for... buddies. <laughs> well, I totally get it. Yeah. But he's looking to me for approval and guidance. It's like, what, a me? Come on, give me a break. But... It's so crucial, uh, those male figures, to help you. Yeah, and when I think about, I mean, you know, I, 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 one thing I didn't, uh, I don't have any experience with, like, the worst of the worst. Like, there mm-hmm. wasn't any sexual abuse or anything mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. You know, my heart really goes out to my friends that went through that stuff because that, I'm already so messed up and I can't imagine mm. um, that, that on top of everything else. Mm. But... What I did experience was just that rage and remorse and, you know, just self-destruction and watching that happen. Um, and how does that lead to you not taking care of yourself? Because when you, see, your when you see that self-destruction in the person that you're supposed to look up to, it's partly what you don't learn. It's partly mm-hmm. the things you don't see. You know, you don't see somebody taking care of themselves. Mm-hmm. You don't see somebody improving day, day by day, but rather deteriorating day But also day. if your self-worth have not, has not been built up enough to think that you matter enough to really take care of yourself. So it's a double whammy mm-hmm. because you all you've ever seen mm-hmm. is, you know, men falling apart and, yeah. you know, and running off the rails or whatever. And that, that, that's been imprinted on you. Mm-hmm. And then on the other hand, you haven't had the dad going, you got this, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and actually the opposite happens with rage and, you know, and, uh, unrecovered, uh, addiction yeah. is that there's so much regret and remorse in it that as the person kind of goes into a spiral, mm-hmm. they kind of drag you down with them and tell you stuff that is awful, mm. you know? So it was really, it was really a double whammy. It was really hard for me to, to, um, to kind of parse all that. And how does this teenager. affect you now? Oh, in all kinds of wonderful ways. So how, <laughs> how does this affect your spiritual struggle? Ooh, boy, I'll tell you. Do you want the truth or lies? Uh, let's go with lies. Okay. No. Okay. Let's tell the people the real, okay. Let her rip. Okay, folks, here's the deal. It makes there's it only there's like literally 27 people will have made it this far awesome. into the okay. podcast. Okay, those are the homies. I wish they could all like. <laughs> and they're usually. I always get emails from. I don't think American buys listen to this podcast. Like oh it's my always goodness. like it's pioneers. Like I'm a pioneer from Guyana and I love your podcast. I think the podcast helps connect people around the world. So big shout out to all the pioneers <laughs> out there who are still on their posts out there organizing devotional gatherings in the local villages and whatnot. Yep. And thanks for thanks for tuning in, you guys. And now we're going to get <laughs> The Deep Hard Truth with J.B. Echol. Nice. That's the name of your podcast. That's the name of uh, The Deep Hard Truth. I don't know. So, number one, it makes it really hard to trust okay. anything. Mm-hmm. Now, that includes, that includes God, mm-hmm. and that includes male authority figures. Mm-hmm. Even Mm Baha'u'llah. It makes it really hard to trust. And you can trust it for anyone. Here's the funny part is that you can you can believe it for everyone else. It's easy for me to believe in world peace and whatever, reconcile reconciling the religions and all these grand things for everybody else. But when it comes but you sort of count yourself out. And I used to have dreams when I was a new Baha'i all the time where I was I was opting out. I was like excluding myself from, from the club mm. in a way mm. and meeting all these angelic kind of beings and stuff and, and me being, no, 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 that's, see, of course, <laughs> that's for you guys. That was how it was. Mm-hmm. And the way it affects me now is that um, 
I have to, like I told you before, I have to periodically strip my knowledge of the faith down to its essence almost and relearn it Mm -hmm. because that feeling of trust, that feeling of faith is still a little bit of an experiment Mm. because it just, it just, uh, I, I, I can never take it for granted. Wow. I have to constantly rebuild that. And Powerful. It's intense. And you know, also, it, it makes that... it hard to to get through the hard times with it sometimes. You know what I mean? The dry periods Well, that's the, what I was just going to say is that um, when I struggled a lot as I was younger and coming back into the Baha'i faith, when I would pray, I just didn't feel worthy. Mm-hmm. So I felt a lot of shame and I would try and pray. It would be like the prayers got stuck in my throat. Mm-hmm. You know, like when you're throwing up and it's just kind of like stuck like a fishbone. And I just was like, as I would try and pray, I'd be like, well, God isn't even listening to this. Why would he? He doesn't even care. Like there's so many who, nice people praying right now. Yeah. Why wouldn't he just... Who cares about my stupid little <laughs> prayer? <laughs> um, right, man. I'm such a failure. So there was a lot of that, like... And then, but that was such, for me, uh, such an immature idea of God, of like this big daddy father figure God, as opposed to an inclusive energy that vibrates every molecule. Yeah. And, and that vibration is love itself. And that by praying, we are harmonizing our inner vibrations with the outer vibrations of the universe and light and love and music and and song and, and power and oxygen and leaves, you know? So, which I'm trying to, you know, my redefinition of spirituality is to reaffirm those ideas of God, the creator, and not scowling daddy, God, disapproving God. That's been, that's been my journey. Yeah. You actually have to, by the way, you'd make a fantastic hippie, man. I'm part. I'm part hippie. Really? Are, do, I, are you still struggling with reconciling that? Or I'm. I'm, good with I'm it part now? hippie, but I. I like the Velvet Underground, so it doesn't. It doesn't mesh. I hate hippie music. <laughs> I was tried to listen to Fish the other day. You know what? I couldn't do it. I was like, Oh no, the, no, no, you can't. It's Actually, so jammy. No, it's it's. You know I hate can, guitar solos. Can. You know I hate guitar solos. Yeah, but you like my guitar solos because. Because they're JB, they're big and pompous. Sometimes I don't like them though. What I mean, I've told you that you're gonna tell me that in front of all these people. I listened to your album. I told you there were a couple guitar solos oh, I would have stripped out. Because... I like the Lou Reed one note guitar solo. Oh man, I like the big epic. You know, <laughs> I know David you Gilmore on wheels. That's what I want to <laughs> yeah. hear. Anyway, you know, I came by. All right, honestly. so inner hippie. Go ahead. What were you? What were you I was just gonna say that that. That rethinking of God mm-hmm. is so vital for so many people, including those of us that are kind of traumatized, traumatized by adults, you know. Okay. Um, uh, my friend calls it, um, what does he call it? He calls it adult children of childish adults or something like that. <laughs> anyway, so... Aren't we all a victim to that? <laughs> so what, what happens is... Is, is that you you have to constantly deconstruct. You have to do all that extra work. Mm-hmm. But what's cool about it, you know, according to Rumi, he says the wound is where the light enters. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was Leonard Cohen. Um, you know? It's both of them. They're both awesome, mm-hmm. aren't they? <laughs> yeah. I mean, how Leonard would you, Cohen how is would kind you of the like, modern day Rumi. How would you like to be confused with Rumi once in a while? Isn't that cool? <laughs> like, let's give it up for Leonard Cohen. So that whole, that whole idea... Mm-hmm. Is, is is interesting because that means that those of us that have that kind of, you know, kind of train wreck of, of, of male education and all the, the things that we're supposed to learn when we're kids and then we go and we, we learn it from something like the Baha'i faith or, you know, from any source that has real, real uh, spiritual depth to it, we can speak the language of all the other knuckleheads out there who went through that stuff, mm-hmm. which is a heck of a lot of people, as you said before. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I think, I think that there's, there's definitely a place for those of us who are, who just had an amazing, uh, an amazing upbringing and just like, 
you know, just a rock solid in, in all these different areas and we can just be a light to the rest of the world. But there's also a place for those of us that are like, I've been there, bro. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that, that has its own thing. It has its own thing. And when you're making art, you know, it comes out. Like writing songs for me, I can't really write songs about things being hunky-dory. You know what I mean? I always say that I can't really, I can't. I can't play normal characters. Okay, so it's kind of like that. Yeah. It's very... I, I can't play a well-adjusted it. character. Right, and I have some friends who make really well-adjusted music, and there's a total place for that. I love it, but mm-hmm. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I gotta... I gotta, Unless I'm doing Baha'i stuff. So that's that's what's cool, is that I can always go over and do like a devotional song that's just... You know, it's just right out of the hidden words and it's just pure as the German snow and that's what it is. But when I do my own thing and I express it, it's usually about conflict and it's usually about trying to figure out how to get back home. Yeah. How yeah. to get back to, you know. What's the name of your album, your your last solo album? Everywhere at Once. Everywhere at Once. Fantastic album. Thank you um, so much, and man. Every track. I mean, I've listened to that. I've listened to that album 28 times and uh, I just love it. And each, each track is a story of a struggle. Um, that's 28 more times than the people that are listening to this podcast right. right now. And all 28 of them, or was it 27 of them? Whatever it is. Anyway, yeah. so I want, I want people to hear it. I'm actually going to do a proper release of that album. I, I couldn't do it because I got a job yeah. at the time, like yeah. right when I was in the middle of mm-hmm. dealing with it. Mm-hmm. I ended up getting a really cool kind of ongoing composer gig that is still going on. Fantastic. But I've realized that that album is is just, I just can't sit on that. I put too much hard work and heart and soul into that stuff. And so it's now It's not I'm on your to, band camp right now? It or? is, but I'm trying to, I, I need to put it on iTunes. I need to put it on Amazon Spotify and, Spotify and yeah. all that stuff. Everybody needs to, you know, and I need to make um, a bunch of a So bunch let's, of let's fast forward for ahead here. I wanted you to talk a little bit about Badasht, Badasht. When we first were talking about it and the first album came out, because I've known you for a long time now. I think I met you like 17, 18 years ago in the Peach Pit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, oh, Badash, that's your Baha'i band. Or you and Eric Dozier are doing this Baha'i band. And you were like, no, 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 man. That's not what it is at all. It's It's a collective. It's a whole different way of thinking about music. So... Tell the people here, there have been three or four Badasht albums out now. There's three. And, um, and it's not your project with Eric Dozier. Uh, what is it? I mean, you've composed a lot of the al- songs on it, but yeah, what the, is it? What is The it? way that thing came about is that uh, a bunch of like-minded friends gathered on Vancouver Island for a little while, Eric and I among them, and we kind of envisioned... From everything that we've, you know, there were a few fairly heavy hitter uh, students and scholars of the faith in that in the group that were kind of like sort of showing us some deep stuff that was inspiring and, and all that. And the, the, the local institutions were really receptive to these ideas. And there was just a lot. It was the right place at the right time mm-hmm. to kind of try new things. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and so what basically the idea was that the spirit of that conference of Badasht. So for those of you who've studied the faith, you know that at the conference of Badasht in 1848, uh, that was basically the moment when the early, when the Babi community, as it was, kind of separated itself in a way from the, so- the society around it and the restraints of Shia Islam and became a thing of their own. Mm -hmm. And Baha'u'llah himself presided over the gathering Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, vindicated Tahere in her, in her, her beliefs and her, you know, Mm -hmm. he, he basically stopped them from criticizing her. She took off the veil. She took off the veil, which was a revolutionary act. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole spirit of the thing. And that has always been, kind of blown me away that's always inspired this is not a tweak to shia islam this is a completely new revelation and it's way bigger than iran and our lives and everything else and you you know let's just let's just feel that moment that rupture from the past and so i was like okay what is that how do we get inspired by that Mm -hmm. now and for a lot of us because we were creative types it was 
Well, let's be really honest. We're really not meeting those needs or having our needs met anywhere in the world. And we're even struggling with it in our own community. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? You know, what do we do? What would happen if we really embraced it and valued it as much as we value scholarship, as much as we value administrative ability, as much as we value social status. When you say it, you mean making music, making art? Making music, making Making art, translating the faith. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because what Mm -hmm. art really does is it, it, it... it translates. It mm-hmm. t- it actually takes complex things and makes them something that you can you can process and you can feel mm-hmm. in the moment, right? So you can you can hear about something over and over and over, but if you see a movie about it, you can connect with it emotionally, mm-hmm. right? So that's kind of we're like, what would happen if we just really went all in with that and invested yeah. in it for a while? Mm. So we tried all kinds of experiments with. <laughs> with uh, the Baha'i communities up there. And it went, it was, it was amazing. We learned a ton. Um, it was totally non-sustainable as far as like, you know, staying alive, but we just had to try it. We just had to, we just had to experience it. And what, one of the things that came out of it was that all that music. And so it has a certain electricity about it because it came out of the field in a way. Ah. We were so buzzed. It was about field the tested. It was field tested, man. And what what happened? We, I mean, we got so so inspired during that whole process that um, people would just walk up to us in the street and be like, "What's your deal?" Like we'd go out for coffee, mm-hmm. and there's that coffee thing again. Dang it! <laughs> My nutritionist might be listening to this right now. Anyway, um, and people would just come over to our table, and just and just start talking like spiritual stuff yeah it was amazing it was almost it was like the 60s all over again it, it, we we might as well have been wearing Hare krishna robes the whole time people could just see us coming yeah and and we were spirit. we were a bunch of you know late 20s early 30s you know knuckleheads but, so how but people they... could tell that we were onto some other stuff yeah and it became really easy to teach the faith it became really easy to communicate with people and work with people on stuff and so that music was being used in, in public. We were doing like, you know, we were having gatherings. We were having uh, public events. Mm-hmm. We were doing all kinds of stuff. And all of those songs were either things that we, that we, we already loved that from, from, our, from our past that we kind of like brought into it. Okay. Or they were things that we just needed to write in order to have that thing in the moment. So it was required, you know, we were right. like, oh, we need, we need a song that gets everyone singing right. or and we so, need a song that and says so, this. Or... Totally. And so I was like, oh man. And I, I remember at one point I watched a Cat Stevens concert that came on TV uh-huh. and I was watching Cat Stevens. I was like, we need a Cat Stevens joint for this. We need like a, we need like a good old, you know, a 1971 Cat yeah. Stevens yeah. Baha'i song. Yeah. And so I was like, say God sufficeth all things you know yeah and that that was like to me that was kind of like a cat stevens vibe and um i still kind of hear him singing it actually in my Mm -hmm. head instead of me Mm -hmm. (laughs) like that's it's 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 all about that that feeling and you know everything was like that so eric had all this you know this ability to raise up a gospel choir out of nowhere Mm -hmm. i mean like he could make any group a bunch of nerdy Canadians. A bunch of nerdy white people, Canadians, doesn't matter where they're from, Eastern Europe, whatever. He's the Johnny Appleseed of gospel choirs, and he can just take <laughs> you and make you sing that music and sing it properly yeah. and even clap on two and four. Wow. It's magical. <laughs> wow. So what happened was all that was, he brought all that into it. Sure. And then, you know, between the two of us, there was this chemistry, like, so... Um, you know, and it wasn't just, it was, it was a, it was a bunch of us. There were, there were people that did uh, drama. There were people that did uh, visual art. There were people that had been, you know, just really in but the, it was insta- unsustainable because you guys just weren't paying the bills. Well, we weren't really trying to at that time. We yeah. kind of wanted to go full out for a few months and do it as a project and mm-hmm. then, and then see. And, you know, I think one of the reasons why I'm not sure how to engage right now is because I think that. I want to figure out a way to do that again, mm. but without having to do it 24-7, you know, to do it while sure. having kids yep. and to do it while having, you know, baseball practice or whatever. 
So, you know, yeah. uh, we weren't in the that weekend mode. a month v- mode of it yeah, or something like but that. But there has to be some way of, of taking the learning from what we did there. Because I don't see a dichotomy between that kind of spirit mm-hmm. and the day-to-day community building stuff that, mm. you, that you're supposed to do according to the process. And when you look in the guidance, you know, there's nothing against it. There's nothing saying that you shouldn't. Sure. You know, take it to that to that level. But then you so did the, the, so the songs sound like that because of that. It was, and then you did the second Vidash album. Were those still yeah. some holdover songs from that experience. Uh, no, or that was somewhat. Different? But uh, some of those songs actually came from much earlier. Um, I had a meeting at my at my house uh, back in like I don't know. I want to say two thousand two or something, mm-hmm. where we had a lot of the L.A. folks. Christopher Bogan was still here yeah. and. Casey and, um, and a Jamie bunch of, and, a bunch of yeah. them came over mm-hmm. and we wrote a bunch of material right there. Some of that stuff still hasn't seen the light of day and could easily get a Badashed Volume Four going. Um, but the idea was: can we write songs that people can sing, yet which do not suck? That was the that was the thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, does it have to be bad in order for people to be able to sing it, mm-hmm. or can we? Can I can I tell you a pet pet peeve of What's mine? that? Can we put to rest we are soldiers in God's army? Okay, see, I, I would say yes. We I don't sure think can. it I don't think it sucks necessarily, but boy, But it doesn't I'm, not suck though. Boy, either. I'm I'm so tired of that. <laughs> I know it has some gospel roots. Okay, here's but the it's thing. also very militant in I a way that you know what? I didn't understand that song until one time I was at the Tennessee uh uh, summer school mm-hmm. and Rachel Price happened to be there mm-hmm. and they started they started playing that song mm-hmm. and I was like okay kill me now if I hear this song one more time I swear I'm just gonna like drive into oncoming traffic mm-hmm. right but you know what Rachel sang that song and made me almost like it I went into a trance. <laughs> she sounded so good. This doesn't say anything about the song, by the way, because Rachel could literally sing the phone book mm-hmm. and you'd be like in tears. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, but Rachel sang that song and rocked it so hard. She put that attitude in it. And I went to Eric and I was like, I don't even know who I am right now. Like what happened? Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> like what, what, what is this? I feel dirty. I, I liked I liked We Are Soldiers. So, and Eric said, oh, yeah. He said, that's an old gospel song. You should hear how we really sing that. It's a totally different song. It, it's, it actually is kind of cool. And, oh, wow. and their original version is way more militant than the Baha'i version. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's, yeah. It sounds like a song. You know, I mean, he, and he kind of educated me about it and said, like, a lot of those songs are the kind of songs you sing when you know that there's like police dogs outside and you're about to deal with like oh, water wow. cannons and yeah. you know what I mean? Like Billy clubs and worse. Right. Right. And he said like those songs have a place. Yeah. And that, and that militancy of those songs. So the reason why it's so corny is because we sing it in this lackadaisical sort of way. Clapping. We are it. soldiers <laughs> and God's Don't do it, um. And yeah, so and, and all, you know, it's cute and everything. So, but really, like, Badash was, the, the albums were partly about trying, how can we find some of those songs yeah. of our very, very own? And then, like, you know, and, do and them you, in, a, in a vibey way, in a moody way that moves the heart, yeah. but isn't too, too hard to sing. Because you know what? People can sing okay. People can sing Motown. People can sing the Beatles. Sure. Those are simple songs. People can but sing it, Let It what's, Be. What's beautiful is you've succeeded because a lot of those Badash songs are being sung all... I, I, I would send you... Oh. People were singing them in New Zealand and Samoa and okay. in, in can I Israel tell you my best, and in Africa. One of my better stories about it? Yeah. I was at a fireside one time. I probably told you this before, but it's... Let's pretend that I didn't. Okay. This girl comes up to me after this fireside and she was this Persian girl from Australia and she comes up to me and she goes, Oh, yeah. I like that. Second last tune you played. I was like, oh yeah, uh, Say God Sufficeth. She goes, yeah, made me homesick. I said, oh really? That's kind of, that's kind of neat, you know? And she goes, yeah, kid in my community wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible Australian accent. <laughs> to take but, you to this point, I, you know what I did? I called Eric Dozier on the phone and I said, we've made it. <laughs> We're folk. Yeah. It's folk now. It's folk music. Nobody knows who made it. Yeah. Nobody cares. Yeah. It just is in the ether now. It's like this and land is your land. Everybody owns that song yeah. and nobody cares 
You know, the right. only thing that matters is that the Bob wrote the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> lyrics, the Bob. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that matters. But the final Badashed album is all youth song. You had uh, youth participation. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the last album was different because... Um, we just, we kind of wanted to show that there's a lot of other stuff going on out there. Yeah. And that, you know, we kind of wanted to take, um, a little bit of the, the, the trust in the brand per se, Mm -hmm. and kind of shine a light on some of the, the people that are out there doing stuff. So we had everything from really raw, like one microphone community music all the way to like these sort of electronic pop type of mm-hmm, things and mm-hmm. it was just all in there you know it's a it's a strange beast that record because you really only need to listen to one song at a time on that one and are because you... each artist is completely different there's there's not that much in common at all and what are you working on now musically anything in the in the bahai vein or are you just focused well, on your other stuff right now? now i'm trying to figure out how to how to make um you know funk rock music that's legit that that is in is spiritually inspired Mm -hmm. whether the baha'is get it or not you know what i mean whether like i just want it to be inspiring i want it to be inspired and it's gonna you once said to me years ago that to to you the ultimate artist was bob marley because he is songs are spiritual and they're social justice and they're fun, good time songs all at the same time. Yeah. So part of our materialistic culture, and it's a Western thing to some extent, Mm -hmm. because we put the intellectual over here and then the heart over there, Mm -hmm. um, is that, and and Baha'i artists, a lot of us, uh, we we all go through these periods, we're all guilty of doing this, most of us anyway, of going... Okay, now I'm going to do my Baha'i thing. Sure. And now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do my my professional secular thing. professional thing. And, or my hobby. Or yeah. whatever it is, yeah. you know, and, and, and actually having two different standards for both, too. So, mm-hmm. like, the Baha'i stuff can be kind of goofy. And my, you know, my, profes- my professional stuff has oh, yeah. to be amazing. Yeah. I, right? remember Mark, and it's just, I remember Mark Bamford once said to me, like... He goes, I'm never late for a Baha'i meeting. He goes, he goes, because what I do is like, I, because he was in show business at the time. He's like, when I go to a Baha'i meeting, I, I, I'm i never late. If I have a meeting with Steven Spielberg, I'm not going to be late. Why would I be late <laughs> for a Baha'i meeting? Why would I, why would there be a discrepancy between like, you know. Wow. It's that's okay awesome. to be, it's okay to be late to this little thing you do on the side right. kind of lackadaisical amateurish let me just walk behind. in no sound check feedback everywhere kind yeah. of you know get get my tattered lyric sheet out in front of me mm-hmm. you know I've done all that but <laughs> but um but you know like the reason Bob Marley is the ultimate to me mm-hmm. is because never once did it occur to that guy that you would separate your political songs from your love songs from your devotional songs and, you know, Stevie Wonder is like that. Mm-hmm. It's all there in one thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think that it's, it's really cool to study those artists, mm-hmm. you know? Cat Stevens. They, absolutely. And I think it's, it's one of the strengths of the, you know, and keep in mind, these guys, a lot of them come out of traditions. So, you know, anybody that was inspired by civil rights and the anti-war movement and that, that whole period from when we were, you know, little kids... That time period was really a fertile time for this kind of a thing. Because you had the Bob Marleys and the John Lennons and the Stevie Wonders, you know, out there in the world. And they were they were combining all those things into one person. That's mm-hmm. what's beautiful about it. So what I'd like to see from myself and from any any Baha'i artist would be like, can you just be... Uh, that person all the time. You said that to me one time. I said, how's it going? What are you up to these days? You said, oh, I'm just trying to be the same human being when I'm with my college buddies and when I'm at a Baha'i gathering and when I'm at work. I was like, okay, see you next year. That's all I needed to know for, you know, I marinated in that one for a long, long time Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it goes with what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see us be able to show up, be a Baha'i, do a love song, do a something right out of out of 
the hidden words, mm-hmm. do something that's a total subjective take on reality, mm-hmm. do something that's really politically charged and really, you know, passionate and mm-hmm. social justice and all that, and do all of that, and do it like Bob Marley, do it all right there, and not separate those identities. So I don't know what that looks like uh, uh-huh. down the road. I don't know what that looks like for Badash, but I will say that whatever I do with those guys again is going to lean kind of in this direction. It will probably take the form of something that isn't really for the Baha'is so much, Mm -hmm. but something that's designed to bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And encourage deep and meaningful conversations with the community of interest and the community at large. And I, uh, Eric and I had a great experience one time, you know, we, we were, uh, we did a gig opening up for Tommy Emanuel, who is like the greatest acoustic guitarist in the world. Mm -hmm. And it was a really intimidating, uh, gig because we watched him do sound check and, you know, we almost went straight to the pawn shop with all our stuff and just like (laughs) bailed on music. Yeah. But what happened was we went up and we played our little set and we just, you know, we jammed out. And one of our songs that we do is Whither Can a Lover Go? And it's right out of the hidden words. We gave an intro to it that talked about the poetry of longing, like you get in Rumi, but you also get it in the blues and you get it in Appalachian music. And we kind of like found a way to weave all that together. And it was it was the best song in the whole thing because and we were just we were it was a flat out Baha'i song. I mean, any Baha'i that was in the room, it would have been like a total dog whistle for, oh, my God, that's the hidden words. But to everybody else that was in there. That was the first time they ever heard Baha'u'llah's name. Mm-hmm. That was the first time they ever heard the blues compared to, you know, mystical Sufi poetry. And we were, we were just doing our thing. And that's one of the things I've actually learned from, from being around Eric and that whole tradition that he comes from. Mm-hmm. Because that's, what, that's, that's where you get your Donny Hathaways and your, your Stevie Wonders. and all, You know, mm. you, you get that that sense of, of, um, what's the word I'm looking for now? Integration. Oh right? uh, yeah. Of, of all of those things. Inte- integration, which comes from like integrity. It's a form of integrity yeah. because you're showing up and you're saying, this is me. Mm-hmm. I struggle. Here's my struggle song. I get really pumped up and inspired sometimes. Here's my, oh my God song. Right. And sometimes I just like stare at my wife in the kitchen and that's, here's my staring at my wife in the kitchen song. <laughs> You know what I mean? Um, but you're going to share uh, a song with us today, and um, I'm very excited to hear what you're going to share. Yeah, the song that I've gotten a lot of feedback from over the years, probably more than any of them. Okay. It was on Badasht Volume 3, and it's a song called New Creation. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason why I've had so many emails and, you know, little comments and stuff about, about this one song is because there's a couple of there, there a couple of ideas in that song that really resonate with folks that haven't necessarily had the most ideal experience so far on the planet mm-hmm. and are trying to figure out how to combine that with the vision of the faith or, or the vision of any kind of faith. Sure. It's not just Baha'is that kind of like locked in on this one song and you know one of the things it says is um it says who am i to call your name you know that song Mm -hmm. um oh i know it i remember from your little acoustic mini ep exactly so that that that's that's how it feels sometimes you know when you Mm -hmm. you approach the and that's a spiritual song without being distinctly baha'i sure but it's it's in the cat stevens bob marley vein why not it's personal it's spiritual and it's well, it, it, the best thing is that it was honest. Like, I, it came out in about as long as it takes to sing it. Mm. Like, I didn't even really get to write that song. Like, that song was just a found, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. It was one of those songs that you just sort of, uh, it's just sort of there already. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you, you get to be the one that, that found it. It That's was fantastic. literally like, like that. And a lot of stuff that, you know, it's magical when that happens. And yeah. it's sort of humbling because you kind of wrote it, but... Yeah. Not really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that song is uh, is one of those. So. It's the, the muse is the Holy Spirit. And some of these things just come from the other side. And we're blessed to have them descend through us. Right on. So, new creation.
Who am I to call your name? You know I'm in no condition. Can these tiny prayers ascend up to your gate and make a new creation? Make a new creation out of me. Who am I to find your faith? I'm in love with my addiction. Is it possible to throw them all away and make a new creation, make a new creation out of me? I'm a walking contradiction But I'm asking that you take this ball of clay And make a new creation Make a new creation Make a new creation Make a new out of me Thanks so much, J.B. Eckel. Anytime, brother. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night. <laughs>